This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, episode 753, recorded on May 7, 2021. I'm Vincent Racaniello. And you're listening to the podcast all about viruses. Joining me today from Fort Lee, New Jersey, Dixon de Pommier. Hello, Vincent and everybody else. Um, it was beautifully sunny this morning with a light breeze, 60 degrees. Now it's overcast, 60 degrees, light breeze. Nice day. Nice day. It was really blue sky earlier and it's all cloudy now. Yeah, exactly. Yep. 17C. Also joining us from Madison, New Jersey, Brianne Barker. Hi, great to be here. Um, again, unsurprisingly, we have pretty much the same thing here. Uh, 64 overcast. Um, Get out. Yeah. I know, it's a, it's a shock. Well, the three of us are very close together. However, wow. from Austin, Texas, Rich Condit. Hi, everybody. Um <laughs> 82 degrees and sunny. Uh, it's gorgeous. It's just to die for. This morning was 55. Okay. Wow. Just crisp, clear, gorgeous. And the skies so, are pure blue, no clouds? Pure blue, no clouds. Very nice. Just wonderful. Nice. At dawn, at dawn, you get this sort of rainbow effect on the horizon and it's Perfect. this crisp air. Everything's blooming. It's just a delightful time of year. Yep. And from Western Massachusetts, Alan Dove. Good to be here. And it's, uh, let's see, wind is uh, 110 at 9 knots, visibility 10 miles, uh, broken 7,500 overcast layer at 9,000. So we've got overcast here. And you are free to land. Temperature is 17C, <laughs> 2.1. Now, Alan, you planning on flying anywhere soon? I haven't really been able to fly to anywhere. I've gone up flying, you know, just to, to stay in practice. And mm. I need to get my, okay. my biennial review soon. But um, now that things are starting to open up again, I'm kind of hoping we'll be able to go somewhere. Go somewhere oh, so, so you have been flying around at least. Yeah, right? yeah. I've been, um, I, I was actually out of it long enough because the flight school closed down mm. that I, when I went back, I had to, you know, go and, and fly with an instructor briefly to, to get checked out again. But then since then, I've been flying somewhat regularly to keep in practice. Great. Very good. And I assume when you're flying, you're wearing a face mask, right? Uh, when I'm with, when I was with the instructor, yes. Uh, <laughs> although he and I are both now fully vaccinated. And he also had the experience of having had COVID back in uh, January. Oh. So oh. he That's is true. now extremely immune. Indeed. <laughs> Alan, what do you fly when you do fly? Um, mostly Piper Cherokees. Um, oh yeah, okay. That's sometimes, a sometimes a Cessna 152. Um, All right. Great. What do you fly, Dixon? Um, Fish. No, usually, <laughs> usually United, but sometimes American. <laughs> <laughs> right. All right, uh, Rich. Can you tell us about these vaccine town halls? Oh yeah. So uh, for those with uh, questions about vaccines. The American Society for Virology, in collaboration with a bunch of other folks, uh, sponsor of free town hall meetings where you can, via Zoom, meet with two out of a pool of 50 experts for upwards of 45 minutes and ask them whatever questions you have and get the best answers we can come up with, including I don't know. Uh, the site uh, to register is asv.org slash education. And we encourage people to uh, have a look at that and tell your friends. I think a lot of uh, our audience are, uh, you know, probably pretty much up to speed, but they may have friends who would like to uh, ask questions and send them along. We'd love to hear from them. There are several of these a week. I heard a good program this morning on NPR, uh, Rich, which was a, sort of a sociological uh, probe into w why people are resistant to vaccines. And it turns out that the mother of the child, who's now eligible for vaccine, by the way, <clears throat> uh, was the one that was the gatekeeper. And the father of the same family was more in favor of giving that vaccine than the mother. Hmm. About three times more willing to have their sons and daughters vaccinated than the, than the mother. So, and they didn't know why they they didn't uh, 
probe that solution much. So I wonder who listens to your town halls, the men or the women? <laughs> uh, uh, I think, actually, that would be an interesting thing to do, gender breakdown, but my knee-jerk reaction is that we have more female participants than male participants. That would be Brianne, great. What do you that, think? That, that is my knee-jerk as well. Um, I certainly haven't recorded the participants um, when I have done them, um, but I feel as though they have been um, more women. And when I have spread the word to my friends, the people who have taken me up on the offer have, have largely all been women as well. All right. All right. Here's a story from Daniel. He told this last night. Elderly couple, he sees they're both COVID positive. He says, you should, you should have, oh, it wasn't him, actually. It was some other uh, primary care facility. He, he emphasized that. He said, because the outcome would have been different <laughs> if they came to us. Go to another care facility. They're positive. They say, you should take monoclonals. The woman said, absolutely. The guy says, nope, I'll be fine. And the doc didn't push it. A day later, the woman's great. Five days later, the guy's dead. And I can't imagine oh, that she didn't wow. try and push him, right? Because <laughs> usually it the is. wife is pushing the guy and he didn't do it and he paid for it. And it's not something to laugh at. It's very sad. No. But Daniel's bottom sad. line was the doctor should really be insistent because he said if you had some, if you had a pneumonia, they would insist you take antimicrobials, right? Yes. So yes, they yes. need to insist that you take monoclonals. They do work. Wow. Yeah, I, I don't like to hear that. All right, we have a little follow-up on the Sputnik spat. Thank you, Alan, for the title. You're quite welcome. Because <laughs> we came up with not very good ones. And this one, Rich, can you read? Sure. Uh, this is from our friend uh, Clarissa. It was to me, uh, and uh, I hope... It's okay with Clarissa if we give her <laughs> feedback here. Um, uh, hi, Rich. I listened to Twiv yesterday. Very good discussion and explanations. Thank you. The discussions are still ongoing here because Russia now decides to go forward with a one-dose vaccine, Sputnik Light. Mm -hmm. uh, and let me pause here because she gives a link to this uh, article, and it's very interesting because um, the Sputnik vaccine now uh, just... Uh, to remind people, uh, is a virus vectored vaccine. The vector is adenovirus. Uh, the Sputnik V vaccine uh, is two doses using two different uh, adenovirus vectors. One is adenovirus 26, which is the same serotype that's used by the Johnson & Johnson slash uh, Janssen vaccine. And the other is uh, adenovirus type 5. Um, and the Sputnik light is simply the first dose, uh, which thus, in my mind, makes it, uh, at least on paper, equivalent to the Janssen and Janssen, uh, the Johnson and Johnson slash va uh, Janssen vaccine. Uh, of course, details uh, are lacking. I don't know that the engineering of the ad 26 vector in the Gamalaya uh, product is uh, exactly the same. I would doubt it as the Johnson and Johnson slash uh, Janssen. I would imagine that it's um, uh, similar, but I wouldn't expect it to be necessarily identical. Plus, I don't know what the dosing scheme is. Nevertheless, on paper, it looks equivalent. And they give in this articles uh, uh, numbers for protection and stuff like that. And they are in the neighborhood of what you see with the Johnson and Johnson slash Janssen vaccine. Um. I'm going to skip over the next bit where she discusses a little bit about the politics uh, in Brazil, um, which are complex and, um, <laughs> and, you know, and not particularly pleasant. Uh, no, unpleasant is a good is a good thing. Uh, and but not uh, that it, we are necessarily oh no. in a better position. I'm just just <laughs> you know to be clear here. Yeah, uh, I wake up every morning and struggle with this stuff. You know. What are, you, what are you going to do? Right. I guess yeah, you're you going to do Texas. Uh, you're going to do <laughs> you're going to do Twiv, and you're yes. going to be a good person, That's and right. you're going to uh, cast the best influence you can on the people who uh, you That's can true. who are closest to you, and beyond that, you're going to understand that this is the world we're living in with lots of different people in it. Okay, so uh, Clarissa says it's important to look at Anvisa, not uh, that's the um, 
uh, Brazilian uh, drug approval, I think of them as roughly equivalent to the FDA. Okay. okay. It's important to look at Invisa not as an academic group of scientists like us reviewing a paper. Their regulatory agencies are entitled to request any documents they feel is necessary to assure the safety and efficacy of products offered by any company. The FDA does the same. It took more than 15 years, I think, for the FDA to, uh, to approve ST246. This was an anti-pox viral drug that both uh, that I was uh, very uh, close to in terms of following the research, uh, as was Clarissa. Clarissa is an old friend of mine. She's a pox virologist. Uh, so it took FDA uh, 15 years to uh, approve FD, uh, ST246 each time requesting another set of animal assays. As I understand it or understood it, and Visa requested further documents on safety about replication, competent adenovirus, and Gamalaya, instead of providing them at once, replied that Anvisa was being political. So, Anvisa refused to approve the vaccine once the documents were not uh, presented. Then Gamalaya re released the document that you discussed yesterday as a response to uh, Anvisa. The bottom line is that all the discussion turned out to be political and Gamalaya probably should have just dropped the attitude and responded to a regulatory agency. The burden of proof lies with the developer. On the other hand, and Visa should not have fed the press with accusations against Gamalaya. Too bad about all this. It just holds up the vaccination program here. So, uh, you know, Clarissa's uh, point from the beginning in uh, we had exchange with both her and Eriko. Um, and they had uh, different uh, spins on this. Uh, and uh, Clarissa was more sympathetic to the uh, Anvisa point of view, which is spelled out here, I think, more appropriately and quite reasonably. And that they were just doing their job, okay, asking for uh, more uh, uh, information. The, the spin that we got on all of this in the press was quite different. It was like, I mean, the first sort of uh, hint we got of this was uh, it sounded as if uh, a an agency in Brazil had actually done plaque assays on the Gamalaya vaccine and found live virus. That's not true. And I don't know how it got perverted to that point. Okay. Uh, but at any rate, Clarissa's point is they're just doing their job. They asked for documentation, and after a little bit of hassle that shouldn't have existed, they got the documentation they needed. And everybody needs to just be, you know, chill about this. Okay. So, so one question for clarification: um, Clarissa mentions here uh, uh, that Gamalaya might be replication competent. Um, uh, so she she mentions that Invisa asked for further documents on safety and about the replication competent adenovirus. So is that the case? And is that different than Janssen or Johnson? I think uh, no. the next so, letter actually kind of dives into that a little bit. Yeah, so the, 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 Gamalaya, the Gamalaya vaccine is replication incompetent. And we went over this uh, last time. All of these adenovirus vector vaccines um, in as uh, part of the deal, they actually, at least the ones I know in detail about, well, they all delete the adenovirus E1A gene, which is the primary transcription activator during uh, adenovirus infection. So without that, uh, you can't get anywhere. You don't get any, you, you don't get any DNA replication. Uh, you don't get any, uh, even the subsequent early gene expression uh, or, or any late gene expression. And all the adenovirus infectors, uh, including Gamalaya, are replication incompetent, okay? But there arose a question during this as to whether or not the Gamalaya vaccine was contaminated with replication competent virus, okay? Um, and uh, as best I can tell, and we discussed this last time, that, uh, that idea arose from a misunderstanding of how the assays to uh, assess whether or not there was any contamination were reported. Right. Okay. They were reported as uh, a basically a, a quite appropriately as a limit of detection thing. They can't detect, uh, they can't detect fewer than 50 replication competent adenoviruses per dose. 
All right. So they said there are fewer than 50. And somewhere in this literature, there's something about uh, uh, Gamalaya saying, maybe this is in the next letter, saying that uh, their permissive, uh, permissible level is 5,000 replication competent viruses uh, per dose. And I don't know where that number comes from, but maybe we'll, we'll get into this. At any rate, uh, the notion that there might possibly be any replication competent virus in any of these vaccines, and Visa took exception to, and at very least wanted clarification, okay? Which is, you know, reasonable. Uh, um, but uh, this got mishandled um, by everybody involved, uh, uh, notably the press. <laughs> okay, excellent. I, I was... The for a second, I was suddenly confused about there being a no. replication competent vaccine that I was not aware no. of. Uh, yeah, and uh, yeah. it is important to point out, as we as we did uh, last time as well, that there are such things as replication competent vaccines. Um, none that are for no, no replication competent COVID vaccines that I am familiar with, but the uh, Ebola VSV based vaccine, that's a replication competent vaccine. Yep. Okay. Oh, yes. So it's not, it's not obviously, I mean, it's not automatically a bad thing. It's also not automatically a bad thing that there should be a certain uh, level of contamination of replication competent uh, virus in a replication uh, incompetent a vaccine. I mean, if you look at the uh, the FDA regulations on food that we consume, all right, they have limits on, you know, like how many cockroach bits you can have per ton yes. or whatever. Okay. So uh, not everything is 100% pure. People yes. set limits. Yeah. Okay. There's there's a limit on rat turds in your food, but it's they, it's not zero. It's uh, it's not zero. It's not zero. Oh my god. They could Excellent. be in there. Excellent. Well, I also can't wait to listen now to that episode. Yeah. I, as soon as the semester's over, as soon as I'm done with the grading. Yeah, listen to that wait. because there is a document uh, from Gamalea that we show, and it's actually relevant to the next uh, letter. But but you know this this link that um, Clarissa provided, it's sputnikvaccine.com is a little bit testy. <laughs> you know, the first ever approved COVID vaccine, cheap, and everybody can have, you know, it's a little, uh, it's not, yeah. not the usual pushy, way. Pushy, pushy. A little pushy. Uh, uh, yeah, well, one of the things that we discussed last time, now I don't know who that is published by, but the, uh, uh, the uh, mouthpiece for Gamalaya mm -hmm. is not Gamalaya itself, but a uh, Russian uh, agency, as yeah. I understand yeah. it. Okay, that's, so you're not necessarily hearing the uh, standard scientific shop talk from scientists. Yeah. Okay, yeah. you're hearing uh, at, uh, uh, at least a mildly politicized sure. um, description. All right, so Raul writes, uh, Hi, Twivers, love the podcast. I'm an avid listener of all the Twee series, especially enjoying the Twiv non-COVID episodes. All right. Good. Following the discussion about Sputnik vaccine slash Anvisa, I decided to dig a little deeper as I found it hard to accept that an institute like Anvisa could misinterpret re results regarding quantification limits. Luckily, I understand Portuguese and could read through some Brazilian media. As it turns out, the issue for Anvisa is that Gamaleya Institute specifies a limit for replicating virus of 5,000 per dose. Anvisa wants this to be zero or under the limit of quantification. They're not arguing that the current batches aren't fine. These are all under the LOQ, which is 50, as Rich said, per dose. It's that they don't want future batches to possibly contain replicating virus up to 5,000 per dose. And he provides a link for part of the document, uh, which is in Portuguese, but it seems to be a table from Anvisa. And yeah, then, there was a yeah, there was a some sort of a, a, a slideshow presentation. Yeah, and this is in visa's requirements for uh, the vaccine: no more than five times ten to the three replicating competent adenoviruses per dose. Um, so I don't understand. That seems like Anvisa's specification. <laughs> I don't know why 
you know, I thought they wanted 50, but this says 5,000. Well, the limit of detection is less than 50. My understanding from this, let me see it. Let's look at the letter again. It's the Gamalaya Institute specifies a limit for replicating virus of 5,000 yeah. per dose. So that's their uh, absolute it has to be less than that. So the implication is that if they did their, and they do assay all these lots they do, yeah. for whether or not they contain replication combinant virus, and uh, the implication is that if they found a signal that said that they had, you know, uh, 500 replication competent adenoviruses uh, per dose, mm. uh, which is now over the limit of detection, but it's less than 5,000, that Gamalaya's judgment is that that's okay. Okay. Yep. Uh, now, I, I don't know how they decide that that's okay. okay. <laughs> or, or whether they even really did decide that that would like, right. it, you know, if that came up, if they detected a couple hundred of them, then would they well, stop that back? Right. What well, would they do? Right. 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 But this and this document, if this is submitted as part of the approval and Envisa approves it, I don't know Brazilian law, but if the FDA approves something, then legally the company can market that product with those specifications. So this would give um, give Gamalaya presumably the ability to ship virus uh, to ship, you know, vaccine that has replication competent virus in it. Right. In which case, you know, Envisa is saying, no, that's not acceptable. We don't we uh, we don't want that. Which we want seems it. fair. Yeah, which seems fair. We want it. We want it zero, or at least uh, not greater than the limit of detection. Right, and you know, fine. Um, and uh, let's uh, I'll point out as well as we did last time that if there is contamination of any of these, and it'd be interesting to understand what the other manufacturers of uh, adenovirus vectored vaccines, what their standards are. Uh, I presume that they do assays to look for replication competent adenovirus. It'd be interesting to know um, uh, what their limit of detection is and uh, whether they have some acceptable limit and how that was arrived at and et cetera. I don't know the answers to those questions. However, it is important to understand that all of these are human adenoviruses that we get infected with. OK, so the notion that there might be a little bit of replication competent adenovirus uh, is not like uh, saying they're injecting you with some uh, mighty uh, toxic thing. OK, it's, yeah. you know, I found a, an article in Science from today. Brazil and Russia face off over vaccine contamination charge and basically reviews the situation. And then there's a paragraph here. Um Anvisa said that although the standard worldwide is zero tolerance for replication competent adenoviruses, Gamalaya set a much higher limit. Its documents displayed by Anvisa stated the tested vaccines had less than 100 per dose. Uh, I didn't see that. We saw 50, less than 50 right. per dose. Some scientists suspect that wording merely reflects the sensitivity of Gamalaya's test or an arbitrary limit, not evidence that the vaccine contains active adenoviruses. Anvisa rejects that explanation. So now... Um, and, and then it says additional information on tested batches um, made it clear there have no replicating viruses in them, but uh, they still haven't resolved this. Uh, it's still not being used. And it's unfortunate because, as Clarissa said, they could use it. People yeah. are dying in the meantime. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, yeah, we had this discussion of uh, on the last episode of what the why there is a limit of detection. Yeah. And yep. what that yep. might be, yeah, and, go, and simply, and, and I've thought about I've thought about that uh, more extensively uh, since. But you know, it's basically the same discussion, um, and you can go back to the episode and, and listen to that. All right, now let's uh, return to actually ferrets. Yes, we've, we've had now for the non-COVID part of the episode. We've had ferrets on before recently, right? Uh, and in the Actually, even though this is the non-COVID part of the episode, it's I'm thinking COVID the whole time. Yes. Mm -hmm. Now, this yeah. is actually a good paper to, uh, to yes. understand why it's so hard to figure out yeah. airborne transmission of viruses. And here's influenza virus, which we've been studying for years, and we still don't know what's going on. So you think we're going to figure out COVID in a year? As I'm far as using COVID ferrets or not. <laughs> so this is, um, re actually, we're returning to two ARCs. Uh, not only ferrets, but in uh, highly pathogenic avian influenza virus, same group that did that work we talked about years ago. 
Influenza A viruses are transmitted via the air from the nasal respiratory epithelium of ferrets, nature communications. Matilda Richard, Richard Judith Vandenbrand, Theo Bestbrer, Pascal Lexmon, Dennis de Mulder, Ron Fouchier, Anise Lowen, and Sander Herfst. So this comes from Erasmus Medical Center and Emory University. And it's all about ferrets and how they transmit influenza viruses. And, and you know, as I said, a number of years ago, this group, Fouché and Herbst, and also separately Kawaoka's group, had uh, taken av high pathogenic avian H5N1 influenza virus, which does not transmit among either humans or ferrets, and they passaged it in ferrets until it acquired the ability to transmit. And they looked at the changes in the virus, try and figure out what was limiting transmission. Of course, that was accompanied by a huge outcry from many people saying it was gain of function that was going to, the New York Times said it would kill half the world if this virus got out. And everyone ignored the fact that this uh, manipulation of the virus made it lose pathogenicity for the <laughs> ferrets. Gee, that's just the detail, isn't it? Yeah. Well, this that whole thing was fed, I think, largely by some rather ill-advised yes, um, comments sure. by one of the authors on this paper, um, who who made some inflammatory remarks to journalists, and that got blown up. And by yeah. the time the whole thing got figured out, um, conference calls had happened, and many things had been misinterpreted. And we had Ron Fouché on Twiv at, um, I think it was Fort Collins. He talked about this, but anyway, um, now we have, the group is back. They're they're working on uh, ferrets and influenza virus, but the the story is different. The story is all about uh, how it transmits, where it comes from in the tract, and where it goes in. Now, ferrets are uh, a widely used model for influenza virus because um, uh, there are a number of animal models, but it turns out the ferret, when you inoculate with influenza virus, gives you similar symptoms as in people, you know, the upper tract infection, uh, anorexia, coughing, etc. cetera. Uh, and ferrets also have turbinates that are kind of like human turbinates. I remember Peter Palazzi, when I was a graduate student, he used to say, say to me, Vincent, ferrets have turbinates like humans. And I had no idea what a turbinate was. <laughs> yeah. So probably a lot of our audience doesn't either. So you ought to do that for them. Yeah. Yeah, so th these are widely used, um, but um, they're not perfect. Uh, you know, mice lie, monkeys exaggerate, and ferrets are not people. That's what we say here on <laughs> TWIV. But they are a good model. They don't they don't tell you everything that happens in people, as you'll see. So, the, so turbinates are a structure in the nose. They are a structure. And they're the wall, yeah, right? The wall. So they're these ripply things. If you look, so if you look at a ferret, a ferret has a snout-like. Well, it's got a snout actually. It's not snout-like, right? <laughs> and when you have know, two little nostrils here in the beginning, and then it goes into a bigger cavity, uh, where when you breathe, the air goes in there, and lining that cavity are ridges that are called the turbinates, right? Those ridges, and that's what we have up here somewhere, and I don't know exactly where they are in us. Right about where your sinuses hurt when you get a bad right, cold. It's kind of right up here. Yeah. Okay. Yes. And it's ripply. And not a lot of animals have these ripply. That's my understanding. And I'm sure I'll get letters saying I'm wrong. But then after the turbinate <laughs> in the ripply, ferret. They're believe it or not. Then after the turbinate, <laughs> the, the passage narrows and it joins uh, with the oral cavity. That, that, what is it? The, the, I guess, it, what is the, the damn thing called? Nasopharyngeal cavity. Nasopharyngeal cavity. And then, of course, the air goes down. Uh, the windpipe or the bronchia, the trachea, sorry, not bronchia, the bronchi bronchia are, are further down sure. and then goes down into the lungs. And so that's the turbinate part. And, and ferrets have turbinates and so do humans. And so part of why they're right. a good model. And, and they're a good model, not just for influenza, but oh, yeah. for some other, other respiratory things viruses as well. And there, yeah. there are many, there are other mammals that have similar types of nasal structures, but there are other factors that make Ferrets relatively easy to work with. They're easy to breed. They're small. They're you know available in pet stores. And there's there's established uh, history here. All right. So what do we I know? Looked up, I, I looked ahead. up uh, turbinates on Wikipedia, uh, <laughs> and um, <laughs> uh, my I came away with the impression that there are our own little uh, air conditioners. Okay, 
that they uh, mm-hmm. filter and uh, temperature modulate the air on its way to the lungs. Okay. So that what you get in your lungs is clean and a nice temperature. I like that idea. Now, a little, a little uh, discussion of how influenza viruses occur, transmission occurs between humans. You can have, uh, you can have person to person contact or through the air via. Here's what they say: respiratory droplets or aerosols. They're making a distinction between large droplets and aerosols, which are smaller droplets that go a long distance. Right? Um, they said they say it's widely accepted that droplets is the key factor for for spread, but that's very hard to nail down, of course. And um, in uh, in animal models, you can show that uh, uh, droplets are a main way of transmission, but they say the ferret model does not allow distinction between transmission via aerosols or droplets. Therefore, the term airborne is going to be used for the rest of the paper. So now we have three and terms. I think that that's a vocabulary that we have settled on yes. previously as well. Yes. Vocabulary here is just awful. And this, and this, these are subtleties that uh, the news media uh, constantly goof up and that people don't understand understandably and that, and that they scientists understand. constantly goof up That's, to be yeah, fair. exactly yeah. exactly uh, yeah so all of this uh for the listeners is in the first paragraph yeah of the paper um the sentence that vincent uh quoted from is the the final sentence of the first paragraph and i actually really liked this paragraph yeah. in the ways that it laid out kind of droplet transmission aerosol transmission evidence for both and we can't tell the difference in this model so here's how we're going to deal with yes. that I, I so just airborne includes both. Yes. Yeah. Air, right. Airborne is both, but I really don't like aerosol and droplets. I think they're all droplets. They're just different sizes. Different but, sizes of droplets. But that's because uh, anyway, it's fine. I, I, well, I'm not sure that the droplet knows uh, which size group it's in. <laughs> no, of course. Whether it should behave differently. That's course. That's right. It is all human. Drop to the ground before you got to another human. <laughs> this right. is all. This is all human. <laughs> Uh, nomenclature. All right. So, and, one, and as a, just as a little side note, that both of the papers we're going to talk about today are open access. So, when we say you can go read this paragraph, uh-huh. you really can. Right, so, another thing you need to know is the re, about the receptors for influenza virus. They're sialic acids, which is a sugar typically linked. It's the last sugar on a chain of sugars attached to a protein. Call that a glycoprotein, and the way the sialic acid can be linked to the next sugar in the chain can be different. Uh, it has a different chemical bond. And the human influenza viruses, right, viruses that circulate among humans, prefer a certain linkage called alpha-2,6, uh, whereas avian influenza viruses bind preferentially to alpha-2,3. And that's important because alpha-2,6 sialic acids in the human respiratory tract um, they are in the, the upper tract, predominantly in the upper tract. They're in the nasal turbinates, the sinuses, the pharynx, and the larynx. And also the upper part of the lower tract, which, you know, the, the uh, trachea, about halfway down. And then if you get way down into the lung, they're not any more alpha-2,6. Now, in contrast, the alpha-2,3, which are bound by avian influenza virus strains, they're mainly down there in the lower tract. They're also actually also in the eye. Some avian influenza viruses can infect people in the eye. Uh, but they have to get down into the lung to initiate infection. That's so the this idea. this is important, then the droplet size is important, right, Vincent? Because yeah, the little sure. drops can go all the way down. In theory, yes. In theory, they can go all the way down. All right, well, so this is also, a, okay, go ahead. I was going to say, it's also potentially important, and we can say more about this after we talk about the data, um, based on whether or not uh, you can get transmission from those different sites. Can you actually get a droplet from that deep in the lung, That's or do right. they come from other places in the yeah. respiratory tract? Right. Yeah, Which that- matters for spillover events uh, when we're worried about bird flu, you know, back when we used to worry about flu. Um and and can this virus spill over into humans? And, the, and of course it can. You find poultry workers who get avian influenza, but they don't spread it very well to other people. And one of the ideas that has that has been circulated and there's accumulating evidence for it, and we're going to talk about more now, is that because it's down low in the lungs, it's not getting out well. So the poultry worker inhales enough aerosol, if you will, yeah, yeah. Um, to get this lower lung infection. 
but it doesn't get back out again very well. And so they don't transmit it to other people. So you don't get a full spillover event into humans. So the question here, as Brienne said, where do the ferrets get infected? And where is the source of virus that they transmit to another ferret? And so, listen, we've been talking about this for 15 minutes. And in the end, it's not clear and it, this virus has been worked on for many, many years. So, you know, similar issues are surrounding SARS-CoV-2 and very few of these kinds of uh, infection studies have been done. I mean, part of the problem is that really the ferret is the only transmission model for SARS-CoV-2 and uh, not many labs do it. So I expect we're going to see more of that in coming years. Well, and SARS-CoV-2 still has to be worked with under BSL-3. Yeah. I mean, there's... Yeah. So yeah. and, and one thing I really liked about this paper was their use of some uh, nice genetic tricks yeah. um, with the, the influenza viruses. And I, you know, I'm not sure if coronaviruses with those same kind of genetic marks have yeah. been developed yet. You'd need to have them to do this experiment. Yeah. So they, they make marked influenza viruses. And actually, I think it seems to me that this was a little bit tortuous, but let's go through it. So they start with an H1N1 human influenza virus strain, and they make uh, a single synonymous substitution in each uh, of the eight RNA segments of the virus. So a single change, which doesn't change the amino acid sequence, it just is a base that they could track. And it, they say this will allow us to differentiate it from the parental H1N1. And the way they're going to do that is to sequence the segment, um, which is, you know, a bit involved. I mean, they get information that's fine and it's quantitative, but you know, it seemed to me that there might be a better way to do that. It just seems torturous, I actually thought right? That, yeah. I, initially, I thought, well, why didn't you just put in some kind of a label? But then the argument could be made, well, your label is interfering with the virus replication. And um, as regular listeners know, flu com it comes with some assembly required. There are these eight individual segments of genome. So yeah, if you, I suppose. If you do want to tag each one and you want to tag each one non-invasively so that it does all of its normal stuff in the normal way. And it... As I thought through it, I thought, well, if, there's not really a cleaner way to do this. And yeah, it's difficult to sequence everything you get back out, but sequencing's gotten pretty cheap. And so I uh, suppose here's here's how you get the definitive answer. Yeah, I, I, uh, I, I liked that it was two <clears throat> viruses that were, you know, largely biologically the same. And so you couldn't make arguments about, oh, well, it's this biological property or that biological right. property. Um, they were, you know, as similar as they could be biologically, but did have this distinguishable factor. So I kind of imagine, I don't know, you know, uh, obviously I've been out of the business for a while, but um, I kind of imagine that an operation as robust as Erasmus yeah. has its own sequencing oh, yeah. operation, plus their commercial sequencing outfits yeah. that, uh, so, you know, for the investigators, it's not difficult at all. You just, it, it give this swab to somebody yeah, right. <laughs> and say, tell me what's in it. Yeah, okay. All you need is money. Yeah, yeah, I suppose. And you can quantify it by the reads and all that. So, okay. So they, the experiment is they take two ferrets, they inoculate them intranasally. So they put the virus in the nose and intratracheally. Uh, and I put a picture of this in the show notes. They put a tube, I don't know, about halfway down the trachea and spritz in the virus there. So the, the ferrets get them both, both locations, right? You get, and at one location they give the parent virus and at the other location they give you the variant and then they do another two with the, the with them reversed, right? And it's illustrated in the figures by giving the viruses different colors, yeah. which yeah. is which is handy, okay? Yes. Mm -hmm. You get a red virus in the nose and a blue virus in your lungs or vice versa. So two ferrets, two ferrets with each combination and then um, they, they do this inoculation. Then four hours later, they put what they call recipient ferrets in a cage next to this cage, separated by grids 10 centimeters apart so they can't touch each other. So the virus would have to go through the air to, to transmit from the donor ferrets to the recipient ferrets. And the ferrets are not wearing masks. <laughs> the ferrets are not wearing <laughs> masks, yes. And then they, they do throat and nose swabs. So the throat now, 
that's part of your mouth, right? And the nose is up. They put the swab in your nose. So two different places. And remember, you put the virus in the nose, essentially. So now you're asking, is it in the nose? Is it in the throat? And then they take these swabs for both the donor and the recipient ferrets every 24 and 12 hours. Uh, and then they sequenced one of the segments to get an idea of what fraction of, of uh, the, the two viruses are being transmitted. And you could tell from where, right? Because you put one in, in one site and one in the other site. So in the nose swabs of donor ferrets, the viruses were the same as the ones that were inoculated. So if you put the wild type in, it was the same. If you put the variant in, it's the same. But in the throat, three out of the four donors, uh, a little bit of virus that was put into the lower tract was found. In the throat, okay, so apparently it's able, you know, there's a mucociliary elevator. I guess that's bringing the virus up and then you swallow it. There's a way to get rid of it. So you're detecting, that's my guess. They don't actually say that. Um, transmission occurred between all four pairs of ferrets. Each time the predominant virus in the recipient was the same genotype of the virus that put, was put in intranasally in the donor. So you do not see transmission of the virus that you put in the trachea. You only see the well, intranasal. So at least if you look at figure two, which I found to be the most helpful because I liked the little pie charts. Yes. And I, the pie charts and the image of the, the ferret, it was sort of very easy to understand. It looks like there's a very small amount mm -hmm. of potential transmission yes. of that uh, virus that was in the lower tract. So it's not a hundred percent of the no. time uh, the virus that's in the nose, there's a teeny tiny yes. little bit. It's, that's <laughs> um, why they the say the predominant, right? It's right. not, it's not a hundred percent. So you could imagine that some gets up enough to be transmitted by way, whatever route is being transmitted. And we, we will explore that. Uh, the virus that they put intratracheally was only found in throat slobs, <laughs> throat slobs, <laughs> throat swabs <laughs> from three donors. Uh, and they were worried that it wasn't actually reproducing in the trachea, so they did an experiment where they uh, euthanized the ferrets after um, it was shown to be transmitted, and, and they could look and see if uh, reproduction occurred. Uh, they, also, they did the same experiment with two other uh, human influenza, well, another human influenza virus, H3N2, right, because there are currently H1N1 and H3N2 viruses circulating in humans. They basically get the same results. I also do it with <clears throat> a pair of uh, highly pathogenic avian influenza H5N1 viruses. And they use one that they, we talked about at the top, that they had adapted to air, airborne transmission among ferrets many years ago. Uh, it's called AT. And then they make their changes in, in that to be able to detect it uh, by their sequencing. Uh, so... Again, the, the predominant virus in the nasal turbinates of all donors, the same as those in the navel swab, in the throat swabs, uh, they find mixtures of tagged and untagged viruses. So again, it's what you put in intranasal. You can find it in the throat, and apparently some is also coming up uh, from the trachea. In the trachea samples, the predominant virus is the one you put in intratracheally, with the exception of... Uh, H3N2 and uh, H5N1A2 and one donor ferret. In, in both cases here, the, the virus inoculated intratracheally was also detected, confirming that it's replicating. That's what they were trying to do by this experiment. So they, they find that uh, H1N1, H3N2, and H5N1AT, which is the ferret-adapted virus, were transmitted in the air uh, between pairs of ferrets. So you do get transmission of all of them. And whenever they do see transmission, the virus inoculated intranasally is the one that you detect mostly in the recipient ferrets. So again, it's just reinforcing this idea that the intranasal inoculated virus is the one that is, that is being transmitted to others mainly transmitted from the upper tract and not from the trachea and lungs. Of ferrets, of course. Right. 
And we will not know if this is the case in humans even after this paper is done, <laughs> unfortunately. I'm not sure how you would do that. But uh, if you're another ferret, you're really interested in the results. If you're another yeah. ferret, yeah. <laughs> uh, then they looked at what cells uh, are being infected, which is called the, uh, the tropism. And um, here we – so there's different tissues up in the tract. The upper tract, you got the turbinates, which they point out is made up of the nasal respiratory epithelium, right? So just think of that cavity in the ferret. The turbinates are there. You've got nasal respiratory epithelium and also the olfactory epithelium where the nerves are going into your olfactory bulb so you can smell. Then you have paranasal sinuses. You have the pharynx. And then the larynx in the back. That's the upper tract. And and this, uh, these human influenza viruses all uh, infect the nasal respiratory epithelium of ferrets, which they say is located in the rostral part of the turbinates in the back, right? Towards the back of the turbinates uh, after intranasal inoculation. But H5N1, the original H5N1, does not reproduce well up there which is quite interesting. And remember, this does not transmit well among either ferrets right. or humans, although it transmits yeah, well it, among birds, right? H5N1 was the avian flu that everybody was really, really concerned about a number of years ago. And turns out it hasn't gained the ability yet to uh, yeah. transmit this way. Right, but birds, when we think about bird transmission, we're thinking about a whole different anatomical system. Yes, yes. Yeah, the birds transmit these in their poop. Um it's a, it's a gastrointestinal infection, and that's why they're great vectors. They fly over and poop on you, and you get their viruses, especially if you're a pig, right? <laughs> right. All right, so the human viruses reproduce well in the nasal respiratory epithelium. They can do staining, immunohistochemical staining, and see damage uh, caused by that. Um, and um, uh, they go through some percentages that are not so important here. The, the, at two days post-infection, the, the the viruses that are transmitted uh, infect. So H1N1, H3N2, and H5N1, the adapted virus, infect 55, 43, and 37 percent of the nasal respiratory epithelium, whereas the parent H5N1 only infects about two percent. So it's not very good at infecting up there, which is probably why it's not very transmissible. Um, and so they conclude that the tropism probably doesn't play much of a role in uh, airborne transmission. They um, then they they look to these. Uh, remember the H five N one that was passaged in ferrets, which acquired uh, airborne transmissibility. They have a number of uh, amino acid changes in the polymerase uh, and in the hemagglutinin, and, and they have obviously a panel of viruses with with each of these. Um, uh, changes isolated or in different combinations. And so they take the uh, opportunity to uh, look at these and see which ones are important. Uh, and interestingly, um, if, if, if they just put their changes in the polymerase, which are contributing, and those have to be combined with changes in the HA, which allow the virus to bind human sialic acid, you know, the alpha-2,6 sialic acid. So you put them together with the polymerase change, and then you get a very good infection of the respiratory, the nasal respiratory epithelium, and that's probably why these transmit well. All right, so then the last experiment they do is they say, can we make some conclusions about what happens in people? And so what you can do is take primary hu human nasal epithelial cells. You can buy these. <laughs> Because <laughs> people get polypectomies, right? They have polyps, polyps removed from their tract. I, I don't know. I guess it makes you snore or something. Uh, is that right? The, the polyps? Well, you can also get, uh, I don't know if this is the same thing, but you can get uh, nasal papillomatosis. That's right. Okay. That's right. Been there. Done that. And okay? you take them out. You, you can get uh, basically warts in your nose. Interesting. And so you <laughs> companies take these from hospitals or wherever – can we have your polyps? And they take them and they sell them. And you can grow them in culture for a while. And these uh, cultures contain uh, most of the cell types that are in the nasal uh, respiratory epithelium, which they say are ciliated cells, mucus cells, 
in basal cells. Uh, so they do binding and infection experiments uh, with these cells. And basically uh, what they find is that the human viruses attach really well. The avian influenza virus does not, uh, unless it has these changes that allow it to be uh, transmitted through the air in ferrets. So they apparently allow something better to happen in human cells, mm -hmm. which is really the first time I've seen that uh, in humans. Uh, and then in the replication, the, the human viruses reproduce really well. Uh, and not so much the H5N1 parent, but the adapted parent does as well. So they say, okay, these uh, these human influenza viruses that are really transmitted well through the air, they can infect primary nasal respiratory epithelial cells, and the H5N1 can't. So maybe that's why there's a difference in transmission, you know, according to the ability to infect those cells. So that's that's it. But I mean, the main the main message here is that the uh, the main source uh, appears to be the nasal respiratory epithelium. Uh, and they go through a big discussion of, uh, of aerosols um, and droplet sizes and, and differences between different studies. But here they say the first time human influenza viruses and mammalian adapted avian H5N1 are transmitted via the air from the upper tract more specifically, the nasal respiratory epithelium, not from the trachea, not from the bronchus, and not from the lung. I just wonder if that's the same in humans. What do you think? Yeah. You think it is? Yeah. But you know the, you know <laughs> the expression. My, I'm putting money on that. <laughs> you know the expression, coughing up a lung, right? right. Yeah. <laughs> so I just wonder if you got someone coughing really hard. A human could really develop a nice... Propulsion, right? Whereas a little ferret, I don't know how much can it go on. So, I don't, so just, the other, uh, uh, the other thing um, in the discussion, they talk about um, particle size a yeah. fair amount, yeah. and they seem to, and I don't know whether this is because of um, comparing with published information or whatever, but they they s seem to correlate the idea of shedding from the upper respiratory tract with predominantly larger particle sizes, right. i.e. Right. droplets. That's right. As opposed to, and intuitively this makes sense, yeah. as opposed to uh, from the lower respiratory tract would be uh, smaller particles, uh, which right. would be by their definition, aerosol. Okay? Yeah, yeah. And this is where, uh, once again, we come back to the whole coronavirus thing. I had a discussion with uh, a colleague, um, a friend uh, the other day about uh, how in their senior center hmm. they have installed some sort of air purifier that has a certain capacity and can, you know, filter out the air. And, and uh, you know, I question, I'm interested in your reaction to this, hmm. I question the effectiveness of something like that because my understanding is that our current understanding, the is that the uh, the royal hour? <laughs> uh, our current understanding is that the the bulk of the transmission of coronaviruses is by droplets. Yeah. Okay. So you're yeah. fairly close to somebody. Not that uh, by these definitions, aerosol transmission could not happen. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And perhaps with a good air purifier, you could mitigate that to some extent. But I don't think sticking an air purifier in your senior center is going to mean that everybody can go without masks, no, right? I don't think so. I think I, the drugs. I think, it's, I think it's hygiene theater. Yes. Um, yeah. That's that was my. I brought up hygiene theater yes. during this discussion. <laughs> yeah. I think yeah. So, I, I, so we we actually have some data from outbreaks on buses and at wedding banquets and and these proximity maps that you get um, where they look at who got it. And everybody at the wedding table got it. And some people at the adjacent table got it. But people who were three tables away on the other side of the room didn't get it. And so the conclusion from that is it's not going really far. It's not right. just floating around yeah. in the air I for agree. hours on end the way measles virus would. Yeah. Um, and it doesn't seem to be transmitting a lot through fomites the way norovirus would. It seems to be a droplet borne virus. Yeah, I agree. And one of, one of the problems is that people try and draw black and white distinctions here. Right. So yep. that if a paper comes yeah. out and yeah. says that they can detect live virus, you know, 
uh, 30 meters from an infected person, then everybody goes, oh, it's airborne. And they assume that, uh, you know, that that's a big risk. Uh, and not only that, but that if you can prevent that, you can mitigate the risk. And it's just not black and white like that. Right. Not at all. No. No, the, not uh, at all. The, um, so this is very interesting because the idea is that this, the aerosols, the tiny particles are generated deep in the lung, right? They say small aerosols likely originate from the deepest parts of the lung where the particles are generated by the reopening of collapsed small airways during the previous inhalation, right? So assuming that's true and you don't generate as many small particles from the oropharynx or the nasopharynx, we know that measles virus is transmitted by these small particles, aeros what everyone's calling aerosols, right? That tells me that the, the virus must be transmitted from the lower tract. And it seems to me that you could test that because there are ferret models for uh, measles virus infection, right? Uh, so I was uh, do that again for me. Measles aerosol. Measles goes is that in these. What you said. Measles goes in these aerosols because it can travel, you know, hundreds of feet, and that's why okay. the the R naught is so high for measles because okay. it goes in these small. And it, I'm learning here that they'll probably generate in the in the lowest parts of the lung. So that's telling me that that's where measles virus is coming out of this epithelium and it's entering those droplets and out they come. Not so much the nasopharynx because. So do you suppose that's uh, like this, primarily a function of where the measles is replicating. As I recall, we've done this before. The yeah. replication cycle of measles in a human is uh, complicated, right? It's not yeah. entirely confined to the respiratory tract. How does that work again? Well, it's got to go in through the respiratory tract. Right. And it can't just replicate there in the respiratory epithelia because of the directionality of that epithelium and the receptor. Receptors on the pattern. bottom, yeah. So it enters right. in so immune the, cells. It enters in so lymphocytes. Yeah, so then it's got to cause a viremia in order to get back out. Exactly. That is virus in the blood. Yeah. And so it gets back out probably via the lower respiratory tract, I right? Think Which so. is why it's showing up in small respiratory particles. That's my guess. I particles. mean, I could be all, okay, totally fine. wrong, but that's what I, I'm guessing. Yeah. It's good hypothesis. And this I year, like uh, the, I like it. you know, obviously there's some <laughs> influenza virus reproduction in the lower tract. I think there's probably some SARS CoV 2 reproduction in the lower tract as well, but they're not getting into the small droplets very often. For some reason, it's mainly the upper tract that is uh, where you get very high levels of reproduction. And I'm guessing that's different for measles. I could be wrong. It so, could also be a function of inoculum size required to initiate the infection, mm -hmm. right? So if measles mm -hmm. in a small droplet, you've got less virus. Um, sure. And yep. measles virus can maybe initiate Absolutely. with a smaller inoculum. SARS-CoV-2 may need a larger inoculum and it's just, just not enough in yes, the small droplets. I, I agree, I agree. I like this idea though. I like this idea that um, the spread, correlation of spread versus particle size has as much if not more to do with where the virus is doing most of its replication than anything else, which is kind mm -hmm. of the take home from this, yes. right? I think so, uh, yeah. You have some that, that, uh, that where the shed virus is shed from the upper respiratory tract, it's going to be in big droplets. If it's shed from the lower respiratory tract, it's going to be in small droplets. That uh, This is making, I, I like this. Yeah. yeah. So so the one thing I've been wondering about with all of this that they, they don't really comment on, and maybe I have read things incorrectly in the past, is people sometimes will make these arguments about um, this relationship with pathogenesis as well, in terms of if the virus is replicating more in the nose versus replicating more in the lung. Um, perhaps if it's in the lower tract, mm. you're going to have more severe disease, um, whereas maybe in the upper tract, you're going to have more transmission. Um, and so I would be interested to know if they could sort of do a similar experiment to this, but look at pathogenesis. Um, and do these ferrets have different amounts of damage um, or different symptoms um, with the viruses instilled in different locations? Yeah, agreed. Hmm. So the con question. conclusion here, this is their model. Influenza virus droplets are expelled from the nasal respiratory epithelium and they're deposited in the oropharyngeal cavity of the recipient. That tells me that 
this is coming in via the mouth, right? Well, I guess I could still go through the nose and go back into the and get back to the into mouth, the yeah. oropharynx, but it's coming out of the nasopharynx. Um, and then the virus, after it hits the oropharynx, it then spreads to the nasal epithelium, and then it can go back out again. And they say, should this model be correct, simple measures that target the upper tract to block transmission could be implemented in healthcare settings. What would that be, like a face mask? <laughs> I think, it I might think be. that's what they're getting at. Hmm. But we already knew that, didn't we? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I mean, we knew that about flu kind of before the pandemic, yes. right? I mean, one of the, one well, of flu, the things for reducing... And, and, Flu has gone way down this past season, right? Presumably yeah. because of that. Now, um, all the respiratory illnesses have so, gone way so down. I thought this was interesting because it just emphasized the complexity of understanding airborne transmission of viruses. And, you know, in the past year, people have tried to make black and white conclusions, as, as someone just said, and it's just not that simple. It's not that easy. Yep. I want to point out that in the biosafety part of this, uh, the methods, they did this under BSL-3+, plus, which is what you need to do for the H5N1 experiments. They were conducted in adherence with the conditions of the U.S. government gain-of-function deliberative process and research funding pause of selected gain-of-function research involving influenza, MERS, and SARS viruses. That's a mouthful. And these <laughs> guys have NIH grants to do this. So they are subject to U.S. regulations. And in particular, after this uh, ferret information was, was published years ago that we discussed earlier, there was a pause instituted by the NIH saying, if you're doing any of this, you've got to stop. And it was not just flu, it was MERS and SARS research as well. And they, that was called the funding pause. And after a couple of years, I think they finally said, okay, you can resume and that's why they say uh, the resum resumption of this with new new regulations you had to adhere to, um, so it can go on. And that's what this is being done under. And you know what? It has been largely forgotten. Although yeah. there are some people who were the original enemies or the original people who didn't like this work, they are still vocal to this day about coronavirus research in general. And I'm not going to name any names, but you know who they are. <laughs> okay, are we good? Dixon, you We're good, good with that? Absolutely. You have a nice, do you have now a nice understanding of airborne transmission? I am riveted to the data. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, for a little snippet, this um, I really thought people would enjoy. This uh, is a paper in Emerging Infectious Diseases, which was published in 2019. I have a whole list of papers that I had stored up before the pandemic to do, and we never got to any of them. So I'm going back on my list. Uh, this is called a historical review, facility-associated release of polioviruses into communities, risk for the post-eradication era. Oh my gosh, it came from the lab. <laughs> Sorry, I just had to get that in there. Uh, Bandiopadi, Singh, Fournier, Caruana, Maudlin, Wenger, Partridge, Sutter, and Zafran. Um, from the Gates Foundation, the WHO, and the CDC. This is a literature review, essentially. They call it a historical review. And In July 2019. Right. And what they do is they review accidental infections with polio, either in the pre- or the post-vaccine era. And there have been there have been a number, and I thought they would be interesting to uh, just go through a little bit. And the first one in 1933, a 29-year-old physician was working on polio who's bitten by a macaque. He got polio and he died. I guess the macaque was infected with with polio, and there was no no vaccine in 1933, right? So, right. I think he must maybe he got some other monkey virus too, and it killed him because. Polio killing you is pretty rare. See, they said that although but the exposure... 1933, you know, <laughs> that era stands out to me because that's the beginning of electron microscopic... That's right. ...examination of viruses. And before, and, and that's right about... I, as a matter of fact, 33 stands out. That was the 
the year, I believe, an influenza virus That's was right. positively identified. That's right. right? That was very early in, uh, the, in the era of yeah, virology. And, and yeah. a lot of that has to do with microscopy. So that's a real cutoff. Before that time, it's, you know, we're talking about filterable agents. Well, okay? you know, they, they say they couldn't confirm exposure to polio. Well, you, Probably you couldn't even grow it in cells in 1930. Right. What would you yeah. do? Right? Yeah. You couldn't do a plaque assay. Couldn't do a plaque no. assay. <laughs> I, I thought that part of this was actually really interesting because it seems like there's a big time discrepancy here um, where we can kind of see the changes in lab procedures that have happened. Oh, yeah. And so yeah. I think, you know, in, in some ways when I look at this and if I were talking to someone who was really worried about lab release, I would show them this and say, okay, look how rare it was with sort of older lab techniques and then look how it cha things change when we yeah. got to sort of more modern lab techniques. Yeah, there's a real, there's a gap in the table starting 1933, you get some in the 40s, you get some in the 50s, then you get a 1955 and then the next one after 1955 is 1991. Yeah. So there's, things got tighter. Uh, uh, yeah, not only that, but the, between, the, the other thing that happens is that uh, once we start making vaccines, we start growing this stuff in huge quantities. Yes. That's right. That's right. And and by the way, the reason that they wrote this is because as we eradicate, then you have to be sure that you get rid of all polio, so it doesn't get it doesn't escape again, right? And you have to be able to identify all the stocks, which is not trivial. And there's. There's a conundrum here because in order to keep producing the vaccine that you're using to eradicate the virus, you have to grow up the virus. Yeah. Especially if you're yeah. making the inactivated vaccine, in which case you're growing up virulent virus. It's not an attenuated strain at all. And uh, that's what um, they, they say. One of the inspirations for this article was this 2017 incident at a facility in the Netherlands um, where there was a leakage at a vaccine production facility. Yeah, right. And, you know fully virulent virus growing up huge quantities to make vaccine to eradicate the virus. And That's right. yeah, this and is we, a risk. We talked about that. That was TWIV 459, I believe. Right. Uh, we talked about that release. Yeah. Um, and there's another one here I wanted to point out in 1935 there. This was actually part of a vaccine trial right. where, <laughs> you know, 12 patients got polio because they really didn't inactivate it. They didn't have to even test it for inactivation, you know, and that's a famous trial. And that actually delayed the development of a vaccine until the 50s because people were scared to do it. And 1935, the 1930s are an interesting period for drug regulation in this country mm -hmm. because we didn't really have much in the way of drug regulation until um, a very famous incident involving um, uh, elixir sulfonilamide uh, it was sulfa, one of the first antibiotics. And there was a formulation of it that turned out to be toxic. But there was no government agency responsible mm. for testing this stuff before it got released. And so it got distributed over a big portion of the country. And they were running around trying to find all the batches and communicate the news. Please don't give this to your patients. And people were dying. Um, so the 1935 incident here, you've got a vaccine under development and you notice the tri the vaccine trial patients age five months to 20 years. Yeah. Um, I mean, this is not the way you do a vaccine no. trial in the modern era, yeah. but at that time, that was kind of the way things yeah. were going on. Well, all these pre-vaccine, what they're called reported incidents of release from laboratories and so forth. They're all like handling monkeys or mice, right. you know, two lab technicians infected uh, while inoculating mice. They both got paralyzed. One doctor doing an autopsy <laughs> infected him or herself. Uh, anyway, there are a bunch of those up to 1954, which, if, and then of course in 55, the Salk vaccine is released. And then shortly afterwards, 164 cases of polio in vaccine recipients due to improperly inactivated vaccine uh, made by Cutter Laboratories. And then a bunch, uh, then as, as Alan said, the next one is 1991, because now by then we've got two vaccines and you get, you know, random isolation of viruses from people, uh, often no paralysis uh, and they're wild strains that shouldn't be where they are. So it's not clear where they came from. And then, of course, the Belgium and Netherlands uh, releases in 2014 and 2017. Again, no, um, no, no adverse consequences 
from that. So there's less. Everybody's vaccinated. Everybody's vaccinated and now. As you, as the last two are associated with large production quantities, where you know valves get accidentally opened and the virus flows into the river or whatever. So it's an interesting. So I mean, we've obviously improved our laboratory technique and and safety from the old days. Except in Baltimore. Um, what happened in Baltimore? They had a contamination of the SARS of the SARS CoV two. Oh well, that yeah. So the one of the contractors who was manufacturing the J and J vaccine um, managed to mix it up with the AstraZeneca vaccine. Um, they that they found all kinds of horrible working conditions. Th there's that a there, that particular too. plant has had issues in the past, and Absolutely. at this point. Um, as part of the uh, part of the handling of that incident, uh, they basically stepped in and put Johnson and Johnson in charge of that plant now. Right, right. So that it now is completely kind of under new management. Right, but it hasn't <laughs> led to any virus. No, 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 no. There's no, no there was no. no viral release, and there was no, and it was caught by quality control, and that vaccine didn't go out to the public. It was just there was a screw up on the line, and um, so that was what that controversy was about. So, so as I said, the reason this is relevant is because as we approach eradication, and by the way, you go to polioeradication.org, you can see where we are. Uh, cases in the previous 12 months, types 2, wild types 2 and 3 have been declared eradicated. Only wild type 1 is wow. still circulating in Pakistan and Afghanistan. There were 36 cases in the previous 12 months in Pakistan, 44 in Afghanistan. That's remarkable. No wild virus in any other country. Um, so this will eventually be eradicated. Of course, there is vaccine-associated paralysis occurring throughout Africa, uh, and we're trying to get around that by mm. switching to uh, an activated vaccine. But uh, I think at one point we will we will have eradicated, and then you have to make sure there's no laboratory-associated uh, virus. So we were asked on two occasions by the CDC, since they know we have polio, please destroy your type 2 stocks. Please destroy your type three stocks and all the plasmids as well. And I have to sign a document attesting to the fact that I have destroyed them. So you, you know, threw out all my plasmids. Threw everything out. <laughs> and if anyone shows up here in New York City with polio, they may come and say, "Is it is it your strain?" You know. <laughs> so uh, so Vincent, for the uh, newbies to Twiv, uh, you mentioned vaccine derived uh, polio virus if you, you might want to briefly elaborate sure. on that so that people don't go away with the wrong impression yeah so the main uh, vaccine used by WHO in the global eradication is the Sabin attenuated polio vaccine which is an infectious vaccine all three serotypes you take orally reproduces in your intestines gives you very good intestinal immunity as well as uh, humoral blood antibodies and T cells prevents polio, but as it reproduces in your intestine and you shed it, it reverts to a form that can cause paralysis. Now, if everyone's vaccinated, it's not an issue, but in all these cases, and there have been a few hundred, 324 just in Afghanistan in the past 12 months, that's because immunization rates have dropped. And when that happens, the circulating vaccine-derived strains, which can circulate for many years silently, they can cause outbreaks. It's kind of crazy, right? The vaccine that you use to eradicate is causing <laughs> outbreaks. Yeah. So, and, and you know, Alan and I wrote about this years ago, right? Yeah. Uh, it was saying that we needed to stop at some point uh, using OPV, uh, to which, you know, the WHO wrote a rebuttal saying we were wrong. And then years later, they said we were right. <laughs> <laughs> and Without now saying we were right, yeah. And now, yeah. <laughs> now they are switching. Well, they've taken the type two component out of the Sabin vaccine because that's causing most of the cases. And um, the, the idea is to give a dose of uh, inactivated vaccine first uh, globally, which is harder because it has to be injected. Which is exactly right? what we suggested. And at the time we wrote the article, they had just changed the date. It was the plan to eradicate polio by the year 2000. And they had just changed it to the year 2005, I think. I think we wrote and, that uh, in the 90s, right, Alan? Yeah, yeah, we wrote that in the 90s. Yeah. And, and for anyone who's worried about vaccines here, we'll just point out this is only something that's possible with live attenuated vaccines. Yes. If a vaccine is made with another type of vaccine technology, say mRNA, um, this is not possible. And in not fact, like that, the, US, the U.S. and all the other developed countries, as far as I know, have switched over now. In fact, I think the U.S. was the last developed country to do this where we don't even give 
or OPV anymore, you get the inactivated polio vaccine, yeah, IPV. Yeah. Uh, and it's now part of a combined vaccine with some other inactivated vaccines. So you get this, you know, multi-shot when you're two years old. Uh, and as far as I know, there are no incidents of anything. This is a polio specific issue. Yes, that's right. right. There are other it live is. attenuated vaccines out there and I haven't seen a problem with that. No. Not only that, but despite this problem, we're on the brink of eradication yes. of the disease globally. Yeah, yeah. the polio, the pol oral polio vaccine is the only vaccine in general human use that can cause the disease it's meant to prevent. Yep. And it, it does that rarely, but it can, and that's a downside of that particular vaccine, which is otherwise a great vaccine. As Vincent pointed out, it gives you both kinds of immunity, bloodborne and gutborne. Um, it's highly effective uh, and has been the backbone of the global eradication campaign, but it's got a downside. I mean, the reason it was so effective is it's very easy to give to kids, right? Yeah. You just pour some drops in. You don't need any special expertise with There's a needle. There's no shot. And um, it's often given on a sugar cube. Yeah. So, um, or you can just give the drops directly in the mouth. So now we will have to uh, switch, unfortunately, to needles. But um, you know, in many countries, they should be using needles for for COVID vaccines. So maybe and measles, mumps, rubella measles, vaccines, MMR, and diphtheria, yeah. pertussis, tetanus. Yeah, you should you should have the infrastructure to deliver a vaccine with a needle. But uh, yeah, this will soon be eradicated, and so therefore. You have to identify labs that have virus, but it's not always possible because many labs have materials that are potentially infectious, like stool specimens, respiratory samples, environmental sewage, right? They could have polio in them and you don't know it. You're never going to find- labeled vials. Yeah. You're never going to find them all. So you just need to be, you, you have to maintain vigilance and, right. you, and you have to have stocks of vaccine ready for an outbreak. Um, so, Vincent, say how long the virus lasts in the environment? It can last quite a while. It's a, it's a rather hardy vaccine as you yeah, as I think a virus. Yeah, about this. As, as you might expect for one that passes through your intestinal tract, right? Yeah, well. It's, uh, it can last for months in the environment. Months. And exactly. so, um, yes, it's, it's, it's a problem. So, Thank goodness there's no animal uh, Now, here's the, here's, here's the rub. Whenever there's an outbreak... What they do is come in with Sabin vaccine because it's really good at stopping outbreaks because you get gut immunity and that tamps down transmission. But then you reintroduce <laughs> the revertence into the population. So what do you do? Well, a new OPV2 strain, uh, and it is a strain because it has very different properties, has just been developed which seems to revert less frequently, right? In, you know, the few hundred people that it's been tested in. We actually should do that at some point in the future. Yeah. Uh, both the construction of it and the uh, clinical trial. And that's probably going to be licensed at some point soon by WHO for these kind of mop-up campa campaigns. I suspect it will still revert, right? I, yeah. I've never seen a virus that couldn't revert. <laughs> <laughs> and there's also this issue, as you pointed out, that we can't get all the polio that exists in right. the world rounded up and contained. It's just it's been everywhere and stored everywhere and uh, might be in permafrost layers for years to come. And, and yeah, who knows where it is. So anyway, we have to stockpile vaccine for many years. So we have to manufacture it. And, and we should probably move toward continuing to vaccinate, as I say, in the U.S. and I think many other countries, it's now part of a combined vaccine against other things that haven't been er eradicated. Yeah. Yeah. And it would make a lot of sense to just keep on doing that indefinitely into the future so you don't have this lingering issue like we have with smallpox, where we did stop vaccinating for, for very good reasons. I mean, that's a whole other story. Um, but now we've got a whole susceptible population to smallpox. So I think yeah, in the case of yeah. polio, you just just keep the vaccine going and don't pretend that it's gone for good. There's, there's one other issue I, I want to bring up briefly, and that is the inactivated polio vaccine is largely made using the virulent strains of polio virus, the three virulent strains. So consider in a, in a post-eradication era, how are you going to grow that up? You're going to have a BSL-4 production lab for vaccine because that will be considered uh, dangerous because they're going to stop vaccinating people, right? So now a few countries have started to actually use the Sabin viruses to make inactivated polio vaccine. 
That which, makes all kinds of sense to me. Right, because there yeah. you don't need such high containment. I think China and Japan uh, have done that. The, the only downside is the yield is much lower for the Sabin viruses, so production is a little more tricky, but can be done, and that would reduce the danger uh, because these releases in the Netherlands and in Belgium, I think they were both you know, wild polio viruses, which you yeah. know, if, if we weren't fully immunized, that could be a real problem. So, so Vincent, mm. what are the correlates of protection for uh, polio, and would an mRNA vaccine be applicable? Uh, I think it's quite clear for polio that the correlates are, are antibodies uh, protecting okay. against polio, right? Poliomyelitis. Right. Um, and I think, um, you know, the shedding is reduced sufficiently to give herd immunity. Herd immunity works beautifully for polio virus um, because in many studies done years ago, you know, after the Sabin vaccines were released, he showed in communities, people who were never immunized were still protected from polio. A classic, you know, example of herd immunity, and it seems to be correlated with antibodies. Now, now it's not to say that virus-specific T cells are not made; they certainly are. Um, but we, no one has really looked at their role. It, it's, it seems to be mainly uh, antibodies. Um, so theoretically, a messenger RNA vaccine, yeah, would work, right? Yes, I think that would be the only problem. Is the antibody epitopes are conformational? You know, they're on the capsid. So you'd have, I'm not sure what the mRNA would encode, right? Because if you encode all the capsid proteins, the four of them, then you'd need a protease to cleave them so they assemble. Um, maybe you could just put the epitopes together on a, on an mRNA. I don't know. You'd we have don't to need, we don't need a new polio vaccine. If we just <laughs> keep using the inactivated vaccine we have, and as I said, it's, it combines well with other vaccines. Yeah, that's true. The marginal, the marginal cost savings of stopping vaccination for polio mm. is so tiny. And you've got all these logistical issues that Vincent just outlined. Just keep vaccinating. But it's you fun know, to just, think. It's fun to think of how to make an mRNA vaccine, right? It's very fun to think of how to make an mRNA vaccine. <laughs> but you know, you, there are so many other viruses you can do yeah, that with. No, I understand. With. I understand. But the, but the mRNA is so beautiful that <laughs> yes, it's very the, uh, the conformational epitope uh, issue is is significant. Significant. Uh, if yes. you're, if we're talking about conformational epitopes that uh, involve basically con uh, epitopes that are a couple of proteins interacting with each other on the surface of a particle, okay? We're not talking about just yeah. conformation okay. of a protein. Yeah, let, let me correct myself. So, so here's a poliovirus particle, right? There are four antigenic sites on the particle to which antibodies bind that will neutralize infectivity. You can, you can take the peptides for those. So I, by say, con conformational is not quite right. What I meant is, you know, they're displayed on the surface of this particle, but maybe you could make just the peptides and somehow incorporate them into an mRNA. And then maybe they would be made and processed, you know, in an antigen presenting cell and displayed. I don't know. It's an yeah, interesting- Yeah, but if you, wanted, if you wanted to get antibodies, you'd need the folded epitope. Right. I know, I know, but those but, but those the linear epitopes might be, you know, the peptides. We're we're actually going to do these experiments with a different enterovirus to see if the peptides would be sufficient uh, to give rise to these antibodies. But you know, I, the, you know, the the, pro, the the particle will be taken up and processed. Yes, that would be great. I just you can't. This is too big to put in an mRNA. That's all. Interesting. Just keep vaccinating. Do you think we're? Do okay, you think, Alan. Alan, do you really <laughs> think the cost of of polio vaccination is that low? Really? At this point, yeah. I mean, this is a totally refined manufacturing process of an off patent. I have well, the manufacturing, that, the manufacturing is cheap, but the distribution is still, you know, significant. Right, That's why in in, uh, in Afghanistan and Pakistan we can't even get in because they kill the immunizers, and so it's God. an issue, right? And so and so. You got this laser focus on polio. Let's eradicate polio so we can stop vaccinating against polio. And then what? We turn off lights and go home and pretend like no other diseases exist? No, no, no. Of course I mean, not. No, of Pakistan, course not. Afghanistan, um, we're talking about places that have huge burdens of disease, much of it vaccine preventable. 
Okay. And so we really want the infrastructure to be able to deliver injected vaccines so we can prevent all these diseases we can prevent with vaccines and now hmm. COVID-19. Okay. Um, and so the, this notion that you'd save a huge amount of money on the logistics, I, I'm just not getting there. So you, you know, would we say sh- we should just keep vaccinating against polio? We should keep vaccinating huh. against polio with IPV in combination with, and I've, I've blanked on what the whole combination is. It's like three or four different um, va- oh, vaccinations T-dap, you get yeah. at once. With, T-dap. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's one shot. Tetanus, diphtheria. Right? Tetanus, diphtheria. Pertussis um, and, and does, polio, and I think they polio combine. Is, yeah. 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 Um, so you still want to vaccinate against those other things and you still want to do that globally. Everybody should get these shots. Right. And yeah, keep distributing it. Keep putting it there. Tetanus, diphtheria, pertussis and polio. TDAP and polio. IPV, it's called. Yes. TDAP <laughs> IPV. Yeah. Right. But I don't think they're giving that to these other co- many many but countries that's where I, i'm saying that's where we should be aiming is to get to I a point it. where we've got the infrastructure to distribute that okay and this notion of this this packaging i've always disagreed with this way the way the who was packaging this mm. that you can eradicate this one virus and then forget about you know building out the rest yeah. of your health infrastructure as a one-shot deal I, I think it makes a lot more sense to have a holistic focus on all the vaccine preventable diseases. And by the way, let's get the rest of your health infrastructure and prenatal care and, you know. Got it. There's a lot there. Okay. Makes sense. All right, let's do some picks. Hey, Dixon, what do you got for us? I have something that I've been fascinated with all of my adult life. And it's a collection of remarkable um, photographs of praying manti. (laughs) <laughs> for lack of, a, of the actual uh, mantises or manta. Uh, it's You have no idea of how diverse this group is until you go to this website. It is remarkable. And it, I picked it for two reasons. One is that I love this animal uh, just for what it does and this stealthiness. It's really the most sinister, stealthy insect I know of, despite the fact that there are lots of spiders out there and everything else. Mantises take it to a next level of disappearing right before your very eyes, but they're really there. How do you see the pictures, Dixon? They're not showing up here. Oh, uh, I, I got them. Oh, they're I've got them. They're me. really cool. They're gorgeous. Yeah, they are, and they're, they're remarkably specific for the environment that they've been selected for. I want to see the praying mantis jokes. Oh, I can't. <laughs> they're here. I didn't, I didn't even get to that part. There is a headless one. <clears throat> there is a head, and it remained alive, by the way, because it has ganglia. <laughs> the other uh, thing so, I... So, uh, Dixon, <laughs> yes, there's one down here called the orchid mantis. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's a famous one. And I hope <laughs> that he's actually eating some moth or something. She. It's a she. she. Sorry. It's quite uh, right. And that that's not... That's that the wing, wing of a moth. Thing. Okay, that's thank what's you. left. That's the leftovers. Okay. Thank you. So this this that's link sort of that you're dessert. giving, <laughs> I, I am not sure exactly what this page is. I, the main page for it is um, like a all Chinese memes. I think. <laughs> um, so yeah, I, I didn't get it like that. I didn't get it like that. Like I went a page to the full of uh, search terms. images on Google and got. I typed out exotic manti and got ah. this. This yeah, is. So I, I, I'm so not I getting have a it. list. I have a I have a bunch of photos, each of which has a link right, to get right. me to more praying mantis photos. Correct. Right. And these can be also bred in captivity. Hmm. So they have become spread throughout the world, basically, to uh, praying mantis <laughs> aficionados. And you get these remarkable photographs of them because they love photographing them. Um, the other thing I'm reminded of is the, uh, the quote that Dorothy McClintock Barbara, famous, Barbara, Barbara. I'm, I'm sorry, Bar- Barbara McClintock kept a orchid mantis on her uh, desk really? in a terrarium. Huh. She said, uh, I don't believe in God except for this, because only God could make this animal, because look at how highly adapted it, it, it couldn't have been around by natural selection. So it had to have arisen some other way. I can't but find they're, this they're, link they're, at all. And Brianne, can you put well, your I'm link so in? I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Sure. I'm, I'm not getting anything except mantis jokes. <laughs> no, no. Well, you've passed those along at least. <laughs> I wanted to read one. Yeah, it could be funny, right? So 
There's the link that I used. Okay. That's the link I posted, I thought. Yeah, it looks the same, but I don't get any pictures. I'm going to send you a I lot of I just get text and there's no pictures and maybe it... Mm. Oh, disappointed. Maybe your ad blocker is stopping it. Yeah, that could be. What what browser uh, are you using? Uh, I'm in uh, Firefox. Firefox. Oh, I'm, in Safari. I'm in Chrome. Chrome or Safari. So I'm in Safari, but I'm not seeing it. All right. Mm. So I'm you, so sorry. No problem. I hope that I hope. I just want to put the right link in the uh, show notes. You know. Got it. Maybe okay. I should send it to you as a an HTT. That's called the URL. Yeah. URL. The URL. That's what I meant to say. All right. <laughs> Brian, what do you have for us? Um, so I have something that was on XKCD uh, recently that sort of made the rounds and I found kind of funny. It's called, it's a comic called Types of Scientific Paper. Um, and there are 12 different little papers that are shown here with big titles. Um, the idea is that, you know, all papers can be classified into one of, <laughs> one of these types. Yes. So they include things like, we put a camera somewhere new. <laughs> or, hey, I found a trove of old records. They don't turn out to be particularly useful, but still cool. That's great. <laughs> um, or my colleague is wrong and I can finally prove it. Uh, <laughs> the next one is great, Brianne. Yes. It is. I, I've published quite a few of the next one. Uh, the immune system is added again. <laughs> yeah, this is fun. Yes, we are five, are this great. is good. Here's a good one. We are 500 scientists, and here's what we've been up to for the last, <laughs> 10, for the last years. 10 years. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and, this is great. and the hover text is also worth uh, worth checking, as always, on an XKCD. Yes. He's got some additional bonus titles. Yes, no, others I, include, we've incrementally improved the estimate of this coefficient. <laughs> Yes. This is I, great. Well, I also like this task I had to do anyway turned out to be hard enough for its own paper. Yes. <laughs> this um, is really or good. some thoughts on how everyone else is bad at research. Yeah, yeah very clever. Love it. This is just great. So you, do you look at this like every day, Brianne, basically? Um, I usually see them on Twitter pretty frequently. Yeah. Um, I don't always go to XKCD every day, but yeah. in fact, I went to XKCD uh, and saw that there had been a few other ones in the past few weeks that have been pretty good that I'd missed. So I was glad to have been there. They're in my RSS feeds. They update the, it up. Uh, he updates the strip three times a week, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Okay. So, okay, cool. If anybody's interested. Alan, what do you have for us? I have um, doing a fun pick this week. This is uh, Rusty Lake Games. And if you haven't played any of these, you certainly should at least give them a try. And I've linked to a specific one that's a good one to start with. It's a, a collection of their first several games. Uh, it's five bucks on Steam. You can get it on Google Play or the App Store. Um, these are games that run on pretty much any device you've got. You can I, I think the iPad is a really good platform for them. Um, probably a smart fridge could run some of these. They're, they're not graphically intensive. They're not reflex challenge games. They're puzzle games and uh, of a genre called point and click adventures. But the aesthetic of these I would describe as kind of, um, kind of Edward Gorey meets David Lynch. Um, <laughs> it's just, it's, it's just off in a way that I really appreciate. And you may too, um, but the Cube Escape Collection is a good place to start. You can watch the trailer for it, and they're um, they're fun. I love the the screen caps here; they're great. Yeah, well, really cool. Yeah, so you, you're you're walking around solving little little environmental puzzles and moving things around and and unveiling a story. And some of the later games actually get really really deep into story. There's one called Roots that's this whole set of interacting stories about a a family. Um, so yeah, there's, there's mm. one here of you and your cat, Alan. Uh, which one is that? At the bottom of a, a guy with a clock and the telephone. Oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> uh, Alan, when this semester is over, in a week, in a week when I've turned in my grades. I have, I have set you up for your, you, yeah. Yes. Cool. Oh, and, well, you're on Switch, so I have additional recommendations if you're. Uh, okay. <laughs> I'm ready. Yeah. <laughs> Rich, what do you have for us? I have a New York Times article called The Departed Could Soon Become Compost in Colorado. Uh, this is a, a something I've heard about uh, before, I think when it first came out in Seattle. But basically, this is a... Um, uh, Colorado is considering legislation that would basically make it legal to uh, compost human remains. Okay. <laughs> And there's a company that does this called 
um, recompose. Um, and uh, what they do is they have these, uh, uh, sound to me like bins that are about four, like a compost Mm. heap right yeah you put about, grandpa in the bin yeah about four feet high and eight oh, feet long and they got uh, wood chips uh and alfalfa in them and uh you plant your loved one in uh one of these and over the period of about a month they are reduced to uh compost they literally push up daisies uh and uh oh, wow. it, you know this they say that it includes uh, teeth and bones, which I, I'm a little surprised at. I wonder if there isn't some processing as is done with uh, cremains mm. to sort of crush uh, what might be left of that. And they also uh, pull out any prostheses that you have. Uh, it's illegal to <laughs> sell the compost um, or to grow food on it, uh, but it can be... Um, distributed in public places or I suppose in your backyard, whatever. And this, uh, I, uh, I actually have a link to the, uh, a company that does this recompose, uh, and, a uh, wiki, uh, a Wikipedia link to the company as well. The, the company's website recompose, you know, has all of this stuff about the services that they Wow. provide to the family associated with this to make this, you know, uh, a sort of funereal, uh, experience, which, you know, I'm personally not interested in, but I, mm. uh, I like the idea of being recycled. I don't, you know, the, in Gainesville and I think a lot of other places, uh, uh, around now too, they have, uh, lots of natural burial type things. Like they had this big plot of land in Gainesville where, um, you could just have yourself planted in a sack and marked with a tree if you wanted. <laughs> and your location is filed as a, as GPS coordinates. Okay. <laughs> All right. But you know, I mean, same deal seems to me, uh, uh but I thought it was interesting. And the article is entertaining. It's got a bunch of puns. Yeah. I was going to say there's this one section of the New York times article with puns that that's pretty crazy. <laughs> Right, like this uh, bill died uh, in uh, pre-pandemic, but it's been resurrected. Look alive. We know you dug it before. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Arg. And Thanks I so. just, uh, sorry sorry for the ongoing uh, game theme this time, but this is, this is straight out of a game I recently finished, a dystopian sci-fi called The Outer Worlds. One of the first quests you do involves... Uh, if depending on how you carry out your conversations, you may find out about wow. some recycling of bodies in a similar manner. By the way, the, if it's not obvious, the scientific justification for this as a pick of the week is this is ecology, dude. Yeah, oh, of course. course. Yeah. Not, that we, oh, yeah. not that we need any scientific justification. <laughs> no worries. Oh, good. Well, my, we have a lot of compost, but we, we don't put any meat into it. They say, don't do that. Your yeah. animals will come and eat it, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. But, uh, the, now, uh, Austin, uh, -huh. uh, we now have three different streams of disposal, right? We've got mixed recycling, we've got landfill and we've got compost. Oh, mm -hmm. all right. Mm -hmm. And, um, that's cool. The composting is free. The recycling is free. You pay for the landfill. All right. And you pay by the size of your bin. Uh, and I would say at this point in time, probably 90% uh, of our trash disposal is either recycling or compost. And compost includes a lot of stuff. Yeah. Okay. Any, any food leftovers can go into the compost. Mm. Uh, any uh, paper products that are, are not suitable for recycling, like a pizza, pizza box. Pizza box. Yep, pizza box, oh. and of course all your yard trash and everything else. So, and it frustrates the heck out of me to go around the neighborhood and see that these people, who, everybody's been provided with re, with composting disposal bins free from hmm. the the city, and only a minority of people actually use them. And hmm. you know, yeah. this stuff can yeah. all be composted. Cool. We can co we compost an incredible amount of stuff. So I, I shred all my uh, my bills and stuff, and I put them in the compost. They, they, you, you layer them with other stuff. It's great. <laughs> so I don't have to. I don't have to recycle it. 
Our town stopped taking shredded paper. I don't know why. Oh. Uh, my pick is a website which was actually at the end of the polio review paper that we discussed. It's, it's the CDC's Public Health Image Library. And it's actually a good place to go for pictures of all kinds of uh, things, viruses, natural disasters, <laughs> environmental health, electron micrographs, people, laboratory science. So if you need a picture, there it is. Yeah. It's a great resource and fun to cruise around in. Yeah. 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 I've been, I've, I think I may have picked this sometime years ago because yeah. I've, I've referenced this many times in my work. You know, you need a picture to illustrate a story yeah. and they've got a huge catalog you and go. you can just search it for stuff. We have a listener pick from Ivan. Hi, Twivers. As you know, Michael, astronaut Michael Collins died April 28th at 90. As I read his obituary, I got reacquainted with his amazing life story and how he dealt with being the one left to pilot the ship while his two crewmates descended in the lunar module to land on and walk on the moon. From the New York Times obituary, Colonel Collins was greatly worried about the moment when the lunar module was to blast off from the moon to dock with Columbia for the trip back to Earth, he knew if that the lander's ascent engine malfunctioned, Mr. Armstrong and Colonel Aldrin might be stranded on the lunar surface or sent into a wild orbit. What happens if they veer this way, that way, the other way, he remarked 50 years later, noting that he had carried a packet around his neck containing 18 contingency plans for rescuing his crewmates. As he wow. wrote of the moment in his memoir, my secret terror for the last six months has been leaving them on the moon and returning to Earth alone. Now I'm within minutes of finding out the truth of the matter. If they fail and to rise from the surface or crash back into it, I'm not going to commit suicide. I'm coming home forthwith, but I will be a marked man for life, and I know it. Oh, my goodness. Whoa. Yeah. <laughs> Pretty heavy stuff. Very heavy stuff. <laughs> It's like the Martian, right? Wow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. My pick is an interactive feature that I found alongside the obituary called Apollo 11 as they shot it. You may have seen it when it was first published. It takes the text of the dialogue between Armstrong, Aldrin, Collins, and Mission Control during the lunar landing, the moonwalk, and the return of the lunar module to Columbia, and intersperses it with the actual photos they took with their Hasselblad camera. It is wow, surprisingly cool. exciting is and moving. Uh, thanks, yeah. and keep up the great work. And uh, Ivan provides the links for that. Wow. Very cool. Nice. This is great. There you go, yeah. Rich. <laughs> I love it, yeah. I'm going to spend and some time with that. Collins, Collins took what I consider the most mind-blowing photograph in history. Oh, uh, yeah. The is Earth, that the Earth Rise? Earth Rise. Earth Rise. Yeah, yeah, it's very cool. All right, that'll do it for TWIV 753. Show notes at microbe.tv slash TWIV. Questions? Twiv at microbe.tv. And if you like what we do, consider supporting us. Microbe.tv slash contribute. Dixon de Pommiers at trichinella.org, thelivingriver.com. Thank you, Dixon. Yeah, you're muted. You're, you're muted. muted, Dixon. Unmute and say it again. Thank you, Vincent. I enjoyed all of this, and I sent you the link in case you can now get the mantis. I don't want you to miss that. All right. I will check it out <laughs> and, and fix it for the show notes. Brian Thank Barker's you. at Drew University, Bioprof Barker on Twitter. Thank you, Brianne. Thanks. It was great to be here. Rich Condit's an emeritus professor, University of Florida, Gainesville, currently in Austin, Texas. Thank you, Rich. Your thing. Always a good time. Alan Dove is at alandove.com. Alan Dove on Twitter. Thank you, Alan. Thank you. It's always a pleasure. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.blog. I'd like to thank the American Society for Virology and the American Society for Microbiology for their support of TWIV and Ronald Jenkins for the music. This episode of TWIV was recorded, edited, and posted by me, Vincent Racaniello. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral. Thank you.